Welcome to the Free Citizens of America's School of the U.S. Constitution. My name is Colin Tice, and today we're going to be reading from Dr. Edwin Vieira Jr.'s Constitutional Homeland Security, a book which explains why the militia of the several states are the only establishments the Constitution explicitly empowers to provide the three crucial elements of homeland security, namely, to execute the laws of the Union, to suppress insurrections and repel invasions. This book describes in detail the practical political steps Americans should take as soon as possible to revitalize the militia of the several states. Chapter 1. The Pressing Need to Revitalize the Militia of the Several States Today, revitalization of the militia is requisite more than ever before, for the following reasons. A. America is being buried in an avalanche of assaults upon her national independence, integrity, and identity, upon her economic prosperity and social stability, upon her cultural heritage, and even upon her ability to survive as a viable political and economic entity. The worst of these include attacks by international quote-unquote terrorists, which, whatever their true sources and actual potentials for harm to persons and property within the United States, must be taken seriously because they provide the context and especially the excuse for what officials in the general government threaten will be a perpetual and limitless war on terrorism, waged with the elastic quote-unquote emergency powers of an at least nascent national police state. Invasion by illegal immigrants much of it instigated, aided, abetted, and condoned by domestic public officials, foreign governments, and international organizations, both public and private, for the purpose of transmogrifying the United States economically, politically, and culturally in order to destroy this country's national integrity and identity. Infusions of illicit drugs, also aimed at destroying the United States, with many narco gangsters being the actual agents of, protected by, or in some other manner connected with intelligence, law enforcement, or other governmental agencies in various countries, and with the massive proceeds from the traffic providing the means to corrupt public officials, law enforcement personnel, and large segments of the economy. Depredations of criminal enterprises organized and operated on a global scale, especially the paramilitarized street gangs now burgeoning within the United States that compromise integral components of or closely cooperate with the drug cartels, terrorist networks, revolutionary movements, and other international criminal syndicates. Rampant domestic gangster government at the national, state, and local levels. That is, criminality in the form of rogue American public officials' open misuse of the law to break the, the law under the color of the law. The dragooning of America as a global policeman in the service of special interest groups, both foreign and domestic not even with the material advantages that usually accrue to a mercenary, because Americans themselves must pay for the dubious privilege with their lives, their treasure, and the odium peoples throughout the world heap upon them, and must live in fear of the desires for vengeance and designs for retaliation that those peoples justifiably harbor in their hearts and draw in their minds. Schemes aimed at overthrowing the Declaration of Independence. To wit, the concerted efforts of domestic office holders coordinated with the operations of such international organizations as the United Nations and so-called non-governmental organizations, or NGOs, both domestic and foreign, to destroy America's homeland entirely by undermining and then eliminating her national independence and sovereignty, submerging Americans within a regional, then hemispheric, and finally, a global new world order that utterly rejects and even ridicules the premise of the declaration that Americans are entitled to, quote, assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Cultural subversion, corruption, and dissolution, from pluralism and multiculturalism 
through outright materialism, hedonism, and insatiable personal and group narcissism and avarice, all of them aimed at making one nation under God, or even one nation under any circumstances in America, first unpopular, then unworkable, then untenable, and finally impossible. And overarching them all, the inherent instability and corruption of America's monetary and banking systems, which, being based on near-fiat currency, monetization of debt, and fractional reserve central banking, must inevitably slide into crisis or collapse entirely, reducing society to chaos. Coupled with a staggering burden of governmental financial liabilities, most of them entirely unfunded except through the emission of other forms of public debt, with the whole utterly unpayable in real terms. On its own, each of these onslaughts gravely endangers America's homeland security. For example, a hyperinflationary explosion of America's monetary and banking systems would visit economic devastation upon the whole country, and, even, and perhaps even the entire world. The German experience in the early 1920s provides a sobering object lesson as to the extensive and intensive damage hyperinflation can inflict on even a well-developed nation with a culturally sophisticated populace. For no historically literate person doubts that this disaster contributed significantly to the rise of Hitlerism, with all of its horrific consequences. To expect cause and effect to differ markedly in the United States today would be imprudent to the level of recklessness. Absent extensive planning, preparation, and organization in local communities throughout the United States that took place and took hold well before such an eventuality, widespread panic and social chaos would undoubtedly ensue, overwhelming the limited police, medical, emergency, rescue, and other social services available. Worse yet, none of these dangers operates in isolation. Instead, because, in many instances, the self-same individuals and special interests, with, with allied, if not identical, purposes lurk behind many, or even all of them, they mutually interrelate and reinforce one another in a sinister symbiosis. So America desperately needs to devise a strategy that can address every one of these threats immediately, simultaneously, and decisively, and smash them all, and their perpetrators, permanently. B. Nonetheless, the only major response from America's public officials at the national, state, and local levels has been to launch an apparently interminable quote-unquote war on terrorism which is directed at none of the dangers threatening America other than imagined attacks by alleged Islamic fanatics. This behavior is deeply and darkly suspicious because of the most serious threats to America's homeland security, that is rampant domestic gangster government, schemes aimed at overthrowing the Declaration of Independence, cultural dissolution, monetary and banking instability, and unbridgeable gaps between governmental incomes and expenditures, not a single one is the product of, or is being worked by, organized groups of Muslims or their sympathizers in this country or abroad. Yet whatever may be domestic politicians' ulterior motives underlying this endeavor, not even the lone challenge from international, quote, terrorism, Islamic or otherwise, can be effectively met by a bureaucratic apparatus centralized in the District of Columbia. The war on terrorism is fundamentally a misnomer, because, quote, war is a constitutional term of art, and the war on terrorism has not been. And due to the diffuse nature of the enemy and the undefinable character of the conflict, cannot be, quote, declared as the Constitution prescribes. Constitutionally speaking, war is a specific set of legal relations between two or more independent nations. For the most obvious example, in an actual war, soldiers of one nation may, within certain limits, intentionally kill soldiers of another nation without thereby being guilty of murder under the law of any nation. 
According to strict constitutional logic, then, a war on terrorism is an existential impossibility, if only because, quote, terrorism is a set of typically paramilitary tactics, not a country or even a political ideology, and because, quote, terrorists do not constitute one or more independent nations, but outside the con but outside the context of international war are at most mere bands of private criminals. Sir William Blackstone, renowned author of the, of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, was the Founding Fathers' legal mentor. At the time of the adoption of the Federal Constitution, the Commentaries had been published about 20 years, and it had been said that more copies of the work had been sold in this country than in England so that undoubtedly the framers of the Constitution were familiar with it. As Blackstone explained, it is held by all the writers on the law of nature and nations that the right of making war, which by nature subsisted in every individual, is given up by all private persons who enter into society and is vested in the sovereign power. And this right is given up not only by individuals but even by the entire body of people that are under the dominion that are under the dominion of a sovereign it would indeed be extremely improper that any number of subjects should have the power of binding the supreme magistrate and putting him against his will in a state of war whatever hostilities therefore may be committed by private citizens the state ought not be affected thereby unless that should justify their proceedings and thereby become partner in the guilt such unauthorized volunteers in violence are not ranked among enemies, but are treated like pirates and robbers. Rather than this being Blackstone's own idiosyncratic notion, this was an understanding that had long been commonplace among expositors of the law of nations. True, a clandestine or regular armed force of some nation could employ the tactics of terrorists on behalf of that nation, which, should it justify their proceedings, would thereby become partner in the guilt. Under these circumstances, however, any defensive war by the United States would be waged against that guilty nation as a whole, not against just the terrorists as individuals, and that nation's soldiers guilty of terrorism would be war criminals subject to the law of nations, not pirates and robbers subject to the domestic laws of the United States applicable to common criminals. So, not surprisingly, Congress has never attempted to exercise its constitutional power to declare war to declare a general war on terrorism, because even contemporary congressmen instinctively realize that such a putative declaration would be constitutionally impossible. To be sure, if Congress could satisfactorily delimit the particulars of quote-unquote international terrorism, it could, outlaw, it could outlaw such a crime pursuant to its power to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. But that power is constitutionally separate and distinct from, and independent of, the congressional power to declare war. And two, neither can a war on terrorism be waged as the Constitution contemplates, for the obvious reasons that the formal conditions of victory, whether through an armistice, surrender, or treaty of peace, cannot be obtained. Global terrorism is a congeries of ideas and emotions in the minds and hearts of individuals dispersed around the world, not an array of men and machines subject to some central controlling structure of government with legal authority that can negotiate a succession of hostilities and then impose upon its own fighters the terms of any such arrangement. 2. The actual conditions for a true final victory can never be achieved. Nothing can compel the surrender of all terrorists now deployed and the termination of all acts of terrorism now directed against the United States, or prevent all future recruitment and or prevent all future recruitment and deployment of new terrorists and their commission of new acts of terrorism. Also, the strategies and tactics familiar with traditional international warfare cannot be employed against terrorists, because terrorists comprise a loosely linked international network of private criminals, 
rather than a regular army or other military establishment of some foreign state that can be identified and targeted as such. They must defend, n they must defend no fixed territorial base, and they can strike whenever and wherever they choose because they recognize and are tied to or excluded from no front lines, rear areas, or neutral territory. Moreover, the constant hysterical harping by politicians and the big media on fighting the war on terrorism at any cost, rather than on preserving America's traditional way of life in every way possible, stirs up primitive emotions and stifles analytical thought, contributing more to mass panic than to a rational solution to that problem just when cold, deliberate, and careful calculation is necessary. The official line on the war on terrorism demands that common Americans suspend their own independent judgment and instead rely in the manner of robots on directives from the top down, the factual support for which the authorities refuse to reveal on the grounds that disclosure of the evidence would supposedly compromise national security. In such wise, Americans are being systematically indoctrinated to believe that they are helpless and hopeless without the authorities, and therefore that they must depend upon, believe, and above all, obey the authorities in all things, without investigation, demure, skepticism, or least of all, criticism. This centrally engineered dearth of knowledge and suppression of intellectual initiative combined with a deluge of unverifiable reports of alleged plots by individuals supposedly capable of unleashing biological, chemical, or even nuclear weapons, and exacerbated by common, by common Americans' own obvious lack of preparation, training, and leadership at the local level, creates an emotional roller coaster of tension, insecurity, suspicion, and fear of horrific dangers potentially limitless in scope. Under these circumstances, people are particularly susceptible to psychopolitical manipulation through planted rumors, the legends and old gray mares familiar to intelligence agents, techniques of mass stimulus response and other black operations by both the authorities and terrorists. 4. Perhaps even more ominously, the war on terrorism provides a peculiarly plastic precedent under color of which public officials can manufacture ever more extensive, ever more abusive, quote, emergency powers, on the basis of the metaphor of waging war. Now, bluntly put, quote, emergency powers are bunkum. In the ancient Roman Republic, the Senate could appoint a temporary dictator and invest him with novel and often sweeping powers to deal with extraordinary conditions, and on both sides of the wall behind the Speaker's desk in the United States House of Representatives are prominently displayed Roman fasces, an axe within a bundle of sticks, symbolizing the plentitude of governmental power, a classical representation of Mao Zedong's dictum that political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. The illusions of modern politicians aside, however, that historical illusion does not invest Congress, or even the general government as a whole, with all the powers of the Roman Senate, let alone a license to arm the president with the authority of an ancient Roman dictator. The modern doctrine of, quote, emergency powers is striking, because unlike the accepted authority of the Roman Senate to appoint a dictator, Emergency powers lacks both a specific source in the Constitution and a definition. If the Constitution contained a clause explicitly delegating to Congress, quote, emergency powers, delineating the content of such powers, and setting out specific conditions under which they could be exercised, by whom and for what purposes, no one could complain. No such provision exists, however. Today, public office holders simply announce that an emergency exists and that they are assuming emergency powers to deal with it. With both the ostensible emergency and the powers that supposedly flow from it unilaterally defined by themselves without reference to anything in the Constitution. And necessarily so, 
For if some specific reference to the Constitution could be made, invocation of emergency powers would be supererogatory. To any legally literate individual, this situation is intolerable. First, the doctrine of emergency powers negates constitutionalism in general. By definition, a constitution is a charter of defined and therefore limited government. In contrast, the doctrine of emergency powers is an apology for undefined and therefore unlimited government. No so-called constitution subject to the unilateral assertion of emergency powers by public officials could possibly survive. For by hypothesis, no such constitution would in any significant way limit those officials who could relax or remove its restrictions on their own initiative simply by saying that some situation had arisen that licensed them to overstep its boundaries. If, all of a sudden, in emergency, as self-interested power-hungry politicians and special interest groups might define it, could beget new, theretofore unheard of powers, constitutionalism in itself would disappear, ushering in government limited only by its own rhetoric, with political hysteria being the only measure of law. Indeed, in any country populated by minimally rational citizens, such a suicidal constitution could never even come into existence. Only veritable political idiots would propose or write, let alone ratify, such a ridiculously self-contradictory, self-destructive document. Second, the doctrine of, quote, emergency powers runs afoul of America's constitution in particular. Anyone who bothers to read the Constitution will see that it, that it, one, delegates to the general government as a whole, or to Congress, the President, or the Supreme Court separately, no emergency powers under that rubric. Two, delegates neither powers that only an emergency can call into existence, nor powers that may be exercised only in an emergency. Three, delegates no power even to declare that an emergency exists, and perhaps most decisively of all. Four, does not even employ the word emergency, let alone define it as a legal principle relevant to any part of the supreme law of the land. Thus, constitutionally speaking, quote-unquote emergency has neither place nor meaning and therefore by itself cannot serve as the justification for or measure of any power whatsoever. Even the Supreme Court has recognized the following as a fundamental constitutional principle. That emergency does not create power. Emergency does not increase granted power or remove or diminish the restrictions upon power granted or reserved. The Constitution was adopted in a period of grave emergency its grants of power to the federal government and its limitations of the power of the states were determined in the light of emergency, and they are not altered by emergency. The existence of some situation that self-serving politicians label an emergency has no constitutional effect in and of itself. Neither a grave national crisis nor any other quote-unquote extraordinary conditions can create or enlarge constitutional power. The Constitution established a national government with powers deemed to be adequate, but these powers are limited by the constitutional grants. Those who act under these grants are not at liberty to transcend the imposed limits because they believe that more or different power is necessary. In short, Congress the President, and the Supreme Court, and the states, subject in addition to their own constitutions, have no more authority to expand their powers or to evade their disabilities simply by declaring an emergency than by screaming SHAZAM! This is obviously not because the Founding Fathers negligently overlooked the possibility of emergencies in their country's future. For example, the Constitution empowers Congress to declare war. 
surely an emergency in the commonsensical understanding of that term. Yet even the existence of a state of war could not suspend or change the operation upon the power of Congress of the guarantees and limitations of the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, or any other amendment or constitutional limitation for that matter. In addition, the Constitution recognizes certain other extraordinary and possible emergency situations, predicates, or conditions precedent for the exercise of specific powers explicitly granted. For instance, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended, unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion of public safety may require it. Congress may provide for the calling forth of militia to execute the laws of the Union suppress insurrections and repel invasions. And the Fifth Amendment commands that no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces, or in the militia, when in actual time, when in actual service in time of war or in public danger. But in each of these cases, the Constitution explicitly defines the emergency that justifies employment of an expressly delegated power, leaving nothing for political interpolation. The Constitution itself exposes the claim that an emergency, with no specific constitutional definition, can create new powers, also with no specific constitutional definitions, as nothing but a trick political conmen employ to confuse and stampede Americans into acquiescing in legislative or executive action that they would otherwise recognize and condemn as dangerous hogwash. It is double talk for the purpose of double dealing. Legitimate governmental powers have nothing to do with it. If such powers actually existed, their proponents would not have to append the desperate adjective emergency. The real emergency that confronts Americans, in every such case, is the lust of aspiring and conspiring usurpers and tyrants for powers that we the people have withheld from all public officials, doubtlessly for good and sufficient reasons. If honest political officials actually need new or expanded powers to serve the common good, the only legitimate way to obtain them is to propose amendments to the Constitution, and then see how many Americans agree when all the particulars are laid on the table for careful examination and untrammeled debate. Notwithstanding their lack of constitutional substance, if sweeping emergency powers can be conjured up for the purpose of waging the war on terrorism, autrance, why cannot they also be invoked to fight the war on crime? the war on drugs, or even the war on poverty, or any other widespread social ill with which, at least as slogans, Americans have become familiar with over the last several decades. After all, if some behavior, object, or condition can be the subject of a war, then the governmental powers appertaining to the conflict must derive from the character and necessary operations of war, not the happenstance identity of the particular enemy, so, in line with the treatments meted out to alleged terrorists these days, may not the godfathers of organized crime, narco-gangsters, and even the white-collar miscreants in executive suits who plunder and impoverish Americans through manipulations of our markets be labeled enemy combatants, exposed to warrantless searches and seizures, imprisoned and incommunicado, denied the writ of habeas corpus, and held without bail on military bases, subject to rendition, i.e. kidnapping to foreign venues, compelled through torture or other physical and mental abuse to be witness against themselves in criminal cases, held to answer for serious crimes without a presentment or indictment from a grand jury, denied speedy and public trials by impartial juries, but instead subjected to military tribunals, and refused on grounds of national security both access to evidence supposedly supporting the accusations and the ability to confront the witnesses against them. Obviously, invocation of the war on argument 
will greatly simplify the work of impatient and unscrupulous law enforcement agencies, as well as encourage and facilitate usurpation, tyranny, and oppression of every sort. And, in the absence of strident opposition and strenuous counteractions by we the people, it will enable the legal system to move faster and farther in that direction. C. In these novel and dangerous circumstances, the war on terrorism threatens to devolve into and to spawn other extra-legal or even illegal enterprises that will result in the imposition on America of a perpetual national security garrison state across the board, i.e. Operation Fast and Furious, so on and so forth. Indeed, every day the possibility more closely approaches reality. This concern is anything but mere paranoia, for historically such degeneration would not be unusual. After all, the very first definition of terrorism is the process of governing through intimidation, as implemented during the French Revolution. And since then, self-styled governments the world over have been responsible for more reigns of terror than any other source. For example, during the first 80 years of the 20th century alone, governments killed some 170 million people. In particular, the cancerous growth in this country of new national forces with unprecedented powers of secret as well as regular police, together with the burgeoning federalization, that is, controlled by the general government, and paramilitarization of state and local law enforcement agencies, have aroused the fears and anger of Americans of almost every political persuasion, and convinced more than a few of them that a full-blown national police state, able and willing to wage a perpetual war of terrorism against common Americans, is not simply an unintended consequence of public officials' incompetence, paranoia, and overreaction to contemporary events but instead may be the cunningly calculated purpose of the politicians in the forefront of these developments, and even more so of the individuals engineering them from behind the scenes. What has happened in the past, and appears to be recurring in the present, bodes ill for the future. In addition, although much of the doomsday propaganda promoting the war on terrorism is hyperbolic, if not largely fictional in nature, America does face undeniably real and immediate dangers, the fruition of which could engender such economic and political chaos throughout the nation that public officials might imagine themselves forced to employ a war of terrorism against average citizens as the only means available to maintain, quote, law and order. The most threatening of these is also the least obvious to, to common Americans namely the blundering or duplicity of America's incumbent public servants, where her monetary and banking arrangements are concerned. Although fiat currency, credit generated by monetization of debts, and fractional reserve central banking are inherently unstable and inevitably self-destructive, this country's leaders have done nothing to forfend or forestall a crisis in this country's financial system. Instead, even though the present burden of governmental liabilities at the national, state, and local levels is already unpayable in real terms, that is, in currency of stable purchasing power, public officials wedded to the Keynesian dictum, we owe it to ourselves, seem intent upon piling supererogatory additions atop this sand castle of fiscal irresponsibility. Even worse, is that insofar as this behavior reflects an incestuous relationship amongst careerist politicians and bureaucrats, international high finance and global criminal enterprises, the public interest in radically restructuring the present monetary and banking systems will always be subordinated to the criminals' to the criminal's interest in maintaining these rackets just as they are, until they sink off of their own corrupt weight and take the United States down with them, politically as well as financially. When that dire day of reckoning finally arrives, the only solution available to America's public servants will be to employ the juggling trick of monetary depreciation 
to repudiate in real terms the vast mass of public debt they've created, in all likelihood leading to a hyperinflationary explosion of the Federal Reserve System's near fiat currency, followed by an implosion of the banking cartel itself, an economic depression of unprecedented proportions, and economic, political, and social chaos. At that point, as their studied and steady erection of the framework for a national police state now suggests, it could easily respond, not with remorse, reform, reconstruction, and restitution to the victims, but with repression. The likelihood of such an outcome should hardly be surprising. After all, the mission of the Federal Reserve System as set out in its Board of Governors present set statutory mandate to maintain long-run growth of the monetary and credit aggregates commensurate with the economy's long-run potential to increase production so as to promote effectively the goals of maximum employment, stable prices, and moderate long-term interest rates. This is a contemporary embodiment of the Keynesian central planning. And Keynes himself recognized that his theory could be adapted to the conditions of a totalitarian state much more easily than could the theory of production and distribution under free competition. So, expectably, the longer the Federal Reserve System remains in operation, the greater the pressure it will exert, or will be exerted through or because of it, to push America's economy away from free competition, and the limited constitutional government that free competition reflects and requires, towards some sort of at least financial totalitarian state dominated by the banking cartel's major clients partisans and hangers-on. Indeed, in principle, the system would not need to change many of its legal stripes to fit that description now. Expectedly, too, when the financial reserve system does slip into crisis, those who fatten off its operations will importune the public officials to employ whatever unconstitutional emergency powers may be necessary to salvage the scheme, at common Americans' expense even if the result is a thoroughgoing police state. Indeed, this is less a chancy prediction of an unknown future than a morally certain extrapolation from the past performance of American politicians and bankers. So, all in all, Americans not only are plagued at present with the absence of homeland security, the lack of a sound strategy for achieving it, and a dearth and a dearth of public officials competent or willing to devise such a plan, but also are confronted with conditions created through carelessness or calculation on their feckless leader's part that seriously threaten homeland security and prevent it from being attained in the future as long as these individuals or others of their ilk remain in control. America's ever-increasing vulnerability, caused by her public officials' ever-increasing irresponsibility, if not chicanery and conspiracy, imperatively demands action. But if anything will be done, common Americans ourselves must do it. We can count on no one else. Thank you for joining us for the School of the U.S. Constitution's series on Constitutional Homeland Security. We hope you'll join us for the next part.